Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Tharoor, for joining us. And I'm being joined right now by two senior journalists. And as I always explain, we are trying to dig deep. We are trying to understand what the ground reality is, do a reality check. We are, you will be hearing Prime Minister over the course of next two days. You heard him today. You're going to be hearing him tomorrow. We got you, Shashi Tharoor, as a counter to that. And now we have two senior journalists, Maya Sharma as well as M.G. Radhakrishnan. Thank you very much, both of you, for joining us. M.G. Radhakrishnan, to you first. Prime Minister Modi was in Kerala today, very tall claim. And we'll start with Kerala because that's also your home state. That's where he was as well today. Two-digit vote share to two-digit seat share. Practically, is that a stretch or is that a political agenda? I mean, is that possibly uh, achievable? Well, it looks difficult. Uh, we were a political you know, circumstances and also the, the record of BJP because uh, the two-digit two -digit, uh, vote share, uh, you know, that, that would be likely because the BJP vote share has gone from 5% to 15% in the last uh, three decades, uh, which is not uh, very bad. But to, you know, to say that it's going to get um, two-digit, uh, to reach two digits in, in, in terms of seat share, looks a bit too much, uh, even if it comes from Prime Minister Narendra Modi, because uh, the BJP or its predecessor, Jan Sang, you know, they have won only one seat in the entire history of Kerala to the Lok Sabha. That too, not the BJP, but an NDA party called uh, Kerala Congress Thomas. So that, so that, was the, that is a record. And um, the 2019 and 2014, as we all know that, you know, the Modi wave uh, elections and 2019, especially in Kerala, uh, especially in the, the elections were held in the aftermath of the, you know, the, 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 the emotional campaign uh, over Shabrimala. Even then, 2019, hmm. we know that BJP has uh, completely sort of, uh, BJP drew a blank uh, in 2019 also because the UDF reaped all the dividends of the Shabrimala uh, agitation. So that was 2019, and we are talking about 2024 when BJP, uh, the situation in BJP doesn't look any worse here. And in the UDF won 20 out of the 20 seats for the 2019 Lok Sabha elections in Kerala. Yes, 19, 19 of the 20 seats uh, went to UDF. And uh, because after the Kerala Congress shifted to the LDF, you know, they, they, you know the, the final tally right. was uh, 182. And so, so 2024, BJP yeah, it looks uh, doesn't look healthier. In fact, it's just the opposite. The BJP has been going down, uh, as um, Shashi said earlier in 2019. Actually, the NDA vote share actually fell, uh, though BJP made a small uh, increase. The the its ally, the BDJS. You know, it, it vote share fell like uh, fell by over two percent. So, so, so BJP's performance uh, in 2019 was actually the NDA's performance in 2019 was actually uh, worse than 2014. So, it's been on a you know, it's been going literally south. The the fortunes of BJP, as it were. Right, Maya Sharma, you know. And it's very it's very interconnected as well. You can't really look at what's happened in the Rajya Sabha today different from what's going to happen in the Lok Sabha. It's very interconnected because if you look at the larger picture, look at what's happening in Himachal and look at what's happening in Uttar Pradesh, contrast that to what's happening in Karnataka. And is it isn't that the true picture of what challenge lies before the BJP in the South. I'd allow you to extrapolate this because no one better than you for this. Well, really, it's quite fascinating. Rajya Sabha, the Congress dominating in Karnataka. Now, that's not something you hear from many states where the Congress can just very easily get the seats it's wanted. It's held on to its three seats. The BJP is held on to one seat at the cost of the JDS. The BJP and the JDS are, of course, allies now in Karnataka, and that alliance didn't really do too well, losing that one seat, while the Congress, with its numbers in the Assembly, managed to get 
three Rajya Sabha MPs straight into Parliament without any problem at all. So that is really fascinating because you don't often hear the term Congress dominance in India as it is today politically. But looking again at the Lok Sabha, Karnataka, of course, has always been fascinating. And that what it does in the assembly, it may do something totally different in the Lok Sabha. And of course, a huge performance in 2019, winning 25 out of the 28 seats and with an independent ally as well. I mean, that's 26 out of 28 seats really pro BJP. And as Mr. Shashitura said, it can only go southwards. The Congress is confident that being in power in the state, they will get more seats in the Lok Sabha, maybe not half of the 28, but definitely a higher number than they did earlier, which was precisely one seat, the brother of Sita Shiv Kumar. So it, it is very fascinating because Rajya Sabha, dominant of the Congress here, Lok Sabha, not quite so sure. But Karnataka really throwing up surprises in the BJP. Maybe Prime Minister Modi not focusing so much on Karnataka as he is on Kerala and Tamil Nadu, because he's fairly confident he will get the numbers when it comes to parliamentary seats in this state, which was described as the BJP gateway to the South. The only Southern BJP government was in Karnataka in earlier years. You know, before I just go to MG Radhakrishnan, Maya, is a difference between a Congress in the South, vis a we a Congress in the North, a leader like DKS? Well, DK Shivkumar, of course, has been credited with a lot of the strategy in many, many types of crises that the Congress has faced. And even today, even in the Rajya Sabha, he is being seen as really the power behind making sure things go smoothly. When unexpectedly, Pupendra Reddy, a fifth candidate, entered the fray, the Congress MLAs were swept away to a hotel, resort politics, not at all new to Karnataka. They were swept away to a resort and definitely under the management of DK Shukumar for this as well. So yes, he's given a lot of credit for managing the Congress here very, very well indeed. He did, of course, initially there wasn't too good of a problem when he perhaps wanted to be chief minister and the party stuck to the senior Siddharamaya. But he seems to have come to some sort of equation now. He is a person they definitely rely on. He is the man for a difficult contest. He loves the challenge. And he's not going to give up the Lok Sabha numbers also without a fight. He is their man in Karnataka. He is relatively young for politicians. And certainly, even in the Rajya Sabha elections, they do see his hand in making sure things did go smoothly for Karnataka. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded, Maya, of how we were covering the last uh, general, uh, the Lok Sabha elections and all the turns that happened with DKS around on the ground. But MG Radhakrishnan, to you, when we, uh, you know, to a contrast of what Maya Sharma is talking about Karnataka, look at Kerala and Tamil Nadu. When you look at what's happening there, with all the power, the political narrative, push and pulls of BJP, with all its might, with PM leading it all, What's stopping the BJP? What, what do you see are the top three challenges or the turf that BJP is not able to get through? Let's say first with Kerala and that Tamil Nadu. Well, Kerala... Like and it's Tamil important Nadu, for our viewers know, to understand it's very, very different political landscape. Absolutely. But they both of them, you know, the kind of historical tradition that they have in Tamil Nadu, if you have the Dravidian tradition where, you know, there was... And ideologically, they have been, they have fundamental differences with uh, you know the Hindu popular text. And in Kerala, you see the secular tradition, the left and the Congress. So these both of these traditions actually have been, been you know they played the bulwark in Tamil Nadu and Kerala against the entry of um, uh, of the Hindu popular text. So secondly, in Kerala, especially in Kerala, you have about forty five percent. Of the population uh, are minorities, the Christians are about 18.5 percent, about 26 percent of Muslims. So they have been traditionally uh, you know, strong barriers for the Hindutva, the BJP, uh, you know, political ideology to get in. So these two major blocks are there. So to do whatever they have tried, you know, that they the, thirdly, the Hindu. Communities, especially the Nayas and the you know the backward, the upper caste as well as the backward caste, they've already been aligned very strongly with the secular parties. If the Nayas, in spite of having no basic fundamental differences with the BJP, 
they have voted largely for the Congress and to a lesser extent to the left. And this, the minor, the, the, the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, the backward, the backward caste Hindus, they have also, as she said, about 55% of the population are Hindus. But predominantly, they are either with the Congress or the left. So whatever, you know, tricks that BJP tried in the last uh, three decades, you know, they have increased that, uh, you know, Shaka strength. Kerala has the large, second largest Shaka, number of Shakas in India. And their vote share has gone. But, you know, there. This kind of, you know, despite the, the, the minorities, definitely it's a predictably they've been against uh, BJP, but even they couldn't make a, you know, any any inroad into the major inroad into the Hindu community also. <clears throat> so, so this is something which they've been, I think, so much. I mean, they've been they've been trying to woo the backward caste. You know that, uh, you know, before such things happened in the north, like the subaltern Hindu to a kind of thing. They tried out in Kerala in, right, in 2013 when Narendra Modi was not even the prime minister. So when he was the Gujarat chief minister, he came down to uh, Kerala to attend backward caste organizations meetings and with Amardana the Mai first and then he came to the Kerala which is the backward, which is the most uh, you know downtrodden backward caste sections, which have all traditionally been aligned with the with the, with the left, and then they wooed the the Edawa community, which is the OBC community, the largest Hindu community. So they have tried that in up to 2013 to 2020, 2018, but nothing has happened after that. the the the, 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 the Edawa group has you know there's a, they got vertically divided in the middle. Uh, you know, there is a small section which is still with the BG. But you know, the, what happened was all these social engineering and other kinds of operations did not mm. <clears throat> succeed in Kerala. So that is why they are now trying to do the Christians. Right. And I mean, it's hard to say successfully or not, but they have had a lot of meetings with the so-called church leaders as well, people, uh, you know, people, leaders from the different sectors. We'll have to see how that really pans out. But these meetings have also been, ha been happening, you know, whether it be for the assembly elections or for Lok Sabha elections. So that also needs to be seen how it gets into the votes. But Maya, try and explain to us, it's complex, but explain to us what is the deal behind Karnataka voting for the BJP repeatedly for the Lok Sabha but shifting and something between the Congress and the BJP for the Assembly. That's, that's very interesting. And for somebody, it's very important to, for, for, the, for viewers to even understand that that's been difficult to crack, not only for the political leaders, but even for some analysts who may be looking into it from a northern prism. It's been happening for years. It's been happening even before the huge rise of the BJP. We had a Janata secular government in Karnataka when there was a different government at the center. We've had the Congress, of course, here with the BJP at the center. We've had a BJP government here when there was UK at the center. It's, 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 it's a very unique situation in Karnataka. Uh, the credit that is given to the Karnataka voters is that they, it is believed that they see it differently, whether it's local issues, whether it's issues concerning the state. They may vote one way. They may vote another way when it comes to the national politics, of what they see nationally. And definitely, uh, Prime Minister Modi does have that large scale appeal. There is no doubt about that. And that appeal does seem to have worked in Karnataka. There are many, many Prime Minister Modi fans here. The city of Bengaluru, all of the three MPs are from Bengaluru are from the BJP. And it is it, it, very likely that that situation will continue. So the voter of Karnataka does seem to differentiate between what they want for the state, what they see as being good for the state, and what they see as being good overall. They have a different perspective when it comes to the nation, when it comes to the country as a whole. It has, of course, fascinated people for decades now, because it's not, as I said, only after 2014. Before that as well, Karnataka did it differently in the Assembly, did it differently in the Lok Sabha. And it's, it's fascinating, really, to see that. And the Congress, of course, with its absolute strength in the Assembly now, We'll be hoping it will be different this time around, but they will be able to have more of a say in the look somehow as well. The BJP hoping that Kanata will continue to do it differently, but really it's up to the voter. The Kanata voter tends to spring some surprises. MGR, when we look at you know the way Prime Minister has been speaking, 
um, you know, we have now talks of, I mean, this is not official, but there seems to be talks of even top ministers who may be contesting from the South, possibly from Tamil Nadu or Karnataka. You have Nirmala Sitaraman, you have Jay Shankar. These are some of the ministers who may be contesting this, this elections, and they have been people who really, you know, people have been watching their work very closely, irrespective of which political spectrum one belongs to. When you look at this, and then you look at, say, how he, he spoke, he praised MGR as well as Jay Lalita today. He, you know, BJP has been talking about the Tamil Nadu connect, the cultural connect, for a state that is very strong about its cultural history, cultural and political history. It's been talking about the parliament building, the sim symbolism uh, that has been taken from Tamil Nadu. The, what represents India today. So, so many narratives being spun in by the BJP in its political story. How do you look at this being viewed by voters? Who is this question to, Shneha? MG Radhakrishnan, would you like to take that answer? To you, mm -hmm. MGR. Yeah, well, I, uh, you know, Tamil Nadu, definitely, you know, there's a fundamental problem with uh, Hindutva, as I said, you know, Tamil Nadu is you know, the entire political and cultural evolution of Tamil Nadu, uh, you know, even right before the uh, freedom movement, you know, it's built on anti-Brahmin, anti-Hindi uh, anti and anti-Northern kind of uh, premises. So it will be very difficult, you know, the, the, to 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 sort of breach that particular Tamil Ravidian fortress, unless you have some completely out of the even box, with uh, these points plans. that seem to be made now repeatedly by the BJP, which is beyond an olive uh, olive branch for that matter. You know, these are narratives that are being repeated time and again, month on month, um, with specific references to Tamil Nadu and the elections. Well, that's right. Yeah, have been trying that. You know, earlier there was this Piruvalluvar thing, then the Sengol thing. But in spite of all that, the traditional, the Tamil Nadu tradition, you know, I'm not saying that that is going to remain forever, but at least for, for the time being, this entire BJP sort of, uh, you know, agenda is not going to make any major headway in Tamil Nadu because of its traditional uh, and not just that, the kind of strength, the political strength that DM, DMK has now, you know, even after Karnanithi's demise, now under Stalin, it has actually built up its, um, you know, um, organization like anything. So unless it's not that, you know, BJP has been trying to woo the, you know, the section, the, back, the most backward sections in Tamil Nadu, they might try. But as of now, I think it is it is yet difficult for BJP to make any headway in Tamil Nadu, even in 2024. I'm absolutely sure about it. Okay, Maya Sharma, um, you know, and I, I this is very evident. The way the aggression of BJP for even a single seat is very evident. Governments are falling. We've seen that happen repeatedly. Cross-voting is happening. We've seen that repeatedly. Will that be able to make any change in South? You know, I, I, I understand Telangana and Andhra are a different landscape. We're focusing today on Tamil Nadu, Kerala and Karnataka. Hopefully, we will look at the, um, uh, the other, st other two states in our, another episode. But Maya, uh, do you see that spillover into the South? I do still believe that the South is a place where the BJP has not been really able to make any headway and is unlikely to make any headway beyond Karnataka, of course, in 2024. The strengths of the regional parties and some others are not likely to leave any space for the BJP to operate. Kerala, as has been discussed, has a totally different culture about it. Uh, the, the base appeal of, say, Hindutva for the BJP elsewhere in the country is not going to really cut any ice in Kerala. The whole Rama temple issue is not a big issue in the South as it has been in the North of the country. Karnataka is of course the exception. It is their gateway to the South. It is their hope that they can establish, continue their dominance in the Lok Sabha in Karnataka, maybe spread it out elsewhere. But in 2024, I do not really see 
they're really making a mark in Kerala or in Tamil Nadu. Karnataka, if they manage to hold on to the number of seats they have, it will be a big achievement for the BJP. But it is more likely that they will lose some, that some seats will be lost. They do have the Congress, there is the Congress government in power in the state, they, who have given a lot of guarantees to the people which have been received. Well, they, they are popular schemes. People have called them freebies, people have called them soft. So these are schemes which reach out to the people, which has gone well, has gone down well. Uh, but elsewhere, elsewhere in the South, I don't think the BJP will be able to, not yet at any rate, be able to make the kind of impact that it is hoping, despite, as you say, they're fighting so hard for every single seat. Right. Um... MG Radha Krishnan, Maya Sharma, thank you very much for joining us, for bringing in depth and understanding into a very, very politically volatile issue that's going to gain even more narratives and challenges and counters in the months that lie before us. But it is a huge bastion and it's a big barricade, a challenge for the BJP led by Prime Minister Modi as of now. It's also something that needs to be closely watched the run-up to the Lok Sabha elections. Thank you very much for joining us. It's time for a short break. On the other side, do tune in for all the latest.